Everything in me Longs for your glory, Lord Where I am filled completely With your goodness and mercy, oh And I will wait for you And I'm satisfied Everything in me Longs for your glory, Lord And I wait for you And I'm satisfied Mm -hmm. How I love you Oh, how I love you, Lord Oh, how I love you Oh
sweeter than my Redeemer. There's no one kinder than the one who set me free. There's no one stronger than my Liberator. There's no one greater than the one who rescued me. morning church welcome to ipc online welcome we love that you're here just wanted to point out that i saw monica here fred and carol how you doing andrew pete ted gilverson how are you saw the rankamas brian how are you so the girls leah and pete yonchar nice to see you phil great that i saw you pop in here robin and steve owen fam Gotcha. How are you? And uh, and also Barb. Barb is in the house. So good morning, everybody. Uh, that's obviously not everyone who's here, but I just wanted to say hi. This uh, this upcoming Good Friday service, uh, 
we are doing it online. So we're going to be doing communion together. Uh, so we want to encourage you to prepare your elements at home. So your bread, wine, uh, juice, whichever you're, uh, you're going to be doing communion with. Um, for kids and youth, if you are online right now and you're paying attention to what we're doing, please go and check out what we have for you online. There's YouTube and also Facebook. Um, our prayer ministry, it happens every Monday morning. If you're able to make it, if you're able to come out, prayer is a powerful weapon. Use it. Come together as a group and, and you know, that's, that's what it's all about. Um, this week we'll be focusing on IPC Care which we're really excited about. We're really pumped about this initiative. Uh, so this is this is awesome. And then also check out this upcoming week's um, midweek. Uh, we're going to be talking all about IPC care on there. Uh, we are planning to be open and live for Easter. Uh, so we're really excited about that. We're really hopeful. We're prayerful. We are praying that we can still stay open. Um, but that is subject to change uh, in the case that the count keeps going up. Uh, so we will we will definitely keep you informed of that. Uh, watch our social media uh, this coming week in order to find out more information. Let's just start in prayer, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Dear Father, we just give you this morning. We just thank you. Uh, thank you for your son. Jesus is, is everything. He is everything, and he, he, is, he is, is so deserving of all of our praise and all of our worship. And Father, we just, we just give you that here this morning. We just, we just open our hearts, and we put, put everything that we have at the foot of the cross, Father. You are so good to us, and, and, and we just love you. And we just give you all of us. In your name, amen. Sometimes on this journey, get lost in my mistakes. Looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over if my story's just begun. They don't want to find me, cause that's what my father does. They don't want to find me. Cause that's what my father does Ooh, lay your burdens down Ooh, here in the Father's house Check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Perfect, you just wanted my heart And the story isn't over If the story isn't good, now, nah, now nah. The bear's never final When the father's in the room I said, the bear's never final When the father's in the room Ooh, lay your burning down Love is breaking through where the fall- 
throughout my history If faithfulness is walk beside me The winter storms and midway for spring And every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life All over my life I see your promises in fulfillment All over my life all over my life Help me remember And I am weak The fear may come The fear will leave me Led your heart to victory You are my strength and you always will be well, I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life All over my life I see your promises in fulfillment All over my life Still you give 
been so, so good to me And I feel no worth You paid it all for me Yes, you did, Lord Cause you have been so, so kind to me Let's uh, just spend a minute in prayer. Let's ask God to bless us as we look into the Bible again, his word. Gracious God, we are here as your people to listen. We're here to understand maybe n- new things. Uh, Lord, we're here to know the mind and the heart of God that we might respond to it with our whole lives. So yes, God, once again, we pray that you'll speak to us and uh, that we will hear well and that we will know how to respond. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to preach today on the biblical idea of one anothering. Now, I know that sounds odd. It is actually an odd way to say something. But it's in reference to the hundred plus times in the New Testament that the little phrase one another is used. 
sometimes it's translated each other. So let me just run through some of these phrases uh, that may be and are likely familiar to, to many of you, but that describe one anothering. It says in the, in the Bible that we're to love one another, we're to serve one another, we're to bear with one another, we're to be kind and compassionate to one another, we're to teach one another, we're to admonish one another, we're to pray for one another, we are to confess our sins to one another, we're to encourage one another, exhort one another, live in harmony with one another, care for one another, honor one another, be devoted to one on another, offer hospitality to one another, accept one another, be patient with one another, be good to one another, and spur one another on to love and good deeds. Now, that's just part of what's in the New Testament regarding one anothering. Over and over again, by a wide variety of the New Testament writers, including Jesus in terms of what he said, um, we are told to one another in this way. It's as if God's trying to get our attention with his repetition. It's with the Lord, as, as if the Lord wants to speak into our lives and into our church through this concept. I'm going to reflect uh, just for a minute on one of those phrases, the last one which I mentioned. Uh, and it comes from Hebrews 10, verse 24. And it says there, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us consider how we might do this. And, and, and uh, you know, what, what we have in this, in this verse, you know, in the original language in the Greek is, is literally this. Let us consider one another, comma, to love and good deeds. That's how it's written in the Greek. And that's obvious, ov often the way it is. The Greek sounds a little odd to the ears of English people. But let us consider one another is the focus. <clears throat> to love and good deeds. The idea here is let's, let's promote or incite one another uh, toward love and, and, and doing good things. The word consider in, in this verse to consider one another. The idea is to be attentive to each other, to, to be aware of one another, to observe, perceive one another, to take notice, to pay attention to one another so as to be better able to understand the needs and the challenges and the difficulties in each other's lives so that we might then help one another, spur one another on, the old translations say, toward good things as we move forward together. See, what's taught here um, is in this one another statement, as in all the one another statements, if you would, is how we are to behave toward one another, act toward one another. Another way to, you might say this is how do we live in relationship with each other? Um, I'm telling you, it was a big deal to Jesus. He often used the phrase, it was a big deal to his apostles who wrote the, re you know, the New Testament itself. Listen, I want to read a quote from uh, a pastor named Andy Stanley. Some of you might know him. He's a really capable pastor. Uh, he works in North Park Church in Atlanta, one of those mega churches in the States. But the quote is this, the primary activity of the early church was to, and I'm going to pause for a minute. <clears throat> How would you fill in that blank? The primary activity of the church was to do what? You know, we might look at the New Testament and the book of Acts, for example, and say, well, it might be to proclaim Jesus, to preach Jesus to people who didn't know him. It might be to evangelize so that others could come to believe in Christ. It might be to worship God. All kinds of possibilities grow to that text. But here's the actual quote from Andy Stanley, and you can tell, you know, think about its validity and, and, and uh, what it might mean for us. It says that he says this, the primary activity of the early church was to one another, one another. Do you get it? The idea, the, the, the primary activity of the early church was to one another, one another. To be in relationship with each other and to treat each other in the ways that I have described to you from Scripture. See, the focus is how we might live together as the people of God. You know, an, an, an author has done some studying in this area and he has categorized all of these one another statements, 100 plus, into four categories. Let me just briefly share them with you. The first is to love. Love one another. It was Jesus who said, love one another as I have loved you. He's saying, in, in the way that I have loved you, so you are to love one another. Sacrificially, kindly, you know, being in relationship with one another. And I've often said, 
as I've preached here at IPC, oh my goodness, I hope that you love people in this church and that you love them like Jesus loves us uh, in, in that dynamic way, in that reality. So the first category is to love one another. Second category is, is all about being in unity with one another. Um, you know, it says to have the same mind as one another, to forgive one another, accept one another, bear with one another. You know, when our difficulties and challenges arise in relationship, you know, we bear with each other. Such a powerful teaching. We don't separate or reject people. Jesus' teaching is really quite pointed. You work toward reconciliation, uh, forgiving and, and, and getting beyond the trouble and moving into a good relationship again. You know, in this area, I'll just take a minute. I haven't given you any, actually, of the negative one another's. But listen to this one. Don't slander one another. And the Bible is so clear about this. We're not to talk negatively about people behind their backs. You know, we're not to gossip, the Bible often says about each other. Jesus is really clear. Matthew 18, if you have something against somebody, um, you go to them and you talk to them and them alone, not other people. That's our natural tendency to get people on side, if you would. Agree with us, tell us that we're in the right. No, nobody other than the person that you're struggling with. So we're to love one another. We're to do what is required to remain in unity as the body of Christ. Number three, the, the next category is to serve one another. You know, Jesus washed the disciples' feet, John 13. And then he says this, serve one another. Essentially, as I have served you, wash one another's feet. And again, it's to look at the example of Jesus and do to others what Jesus has done for us. So as we think of ourselves in the church, it's all about serving. I'm your servant. That's what minister means, by the way. You're my servant. We are to serve one another's needs by being attentive to, considering the needs of others. And when we see the need, we're to act to meet those needs. And then the last category is actually encouragement. Encourage one another, exhort one another, uh, and so forth. It's, it's this this example of this teaching that we're giving to, to spur one another on, to empower, to encourage. See, I would suggest to you, even in that summation, that's the model of what the church is called to be. Can you imagine living in a church which is always loving one another, living in unity with one another, serving one another, and encouraging one another? Oh, it'd be amazing. And that's obviously what we have to keep working toward and create here at IPC. Now, the specific application that I want to bring uh, this morning regarding this teaching uh, about how to treat one another, how to act and be in relationship with one another, has specifically to do with people who are struggling, who are hurting, and who are really in need of care. Our vision statement says this. Let me read it to you. One of the statements in, in the vision itself. We see a compassionate church following Christ's example to care for those going through difficult and painful experiences in life, tangibly demonstrating God's love by walking with them to a place of healing, restoration, and renewed joy. Now, I read that, and I love that. <laughs> I actually remember forming uh, that sentence with elders as we were struggling to put into words what the vision uh, it, uh, is for our church was at that point. Um, but especially I like that la the last part of it. You know, tangibly demonstrating God's love. How? By walking with them, people who are struggling, to a place of healing, restoration, and renewed joy. You know, that, that is a tremendous vision for us as the people of God, living together, one anothering, one another, one another. It's a tremendous way to think about how we might treat one another and be good to one another and encourage one another, especially when people are struggling. Uh, now, of course, how this might happen is a critical component in the understanding, of course, uh, in, in how we act in this way. Because I would suggest to you this morning that somewhere along the line, we have sidelined the biblical idea of one another in one another. Uh, we, we, we have got
gotten to a place, and I'm not exactly sure how it happened, but instead of everybody in the church caring for everyone in the church, especially those who are hurting and in need, we've developed the practice of giving that role to one person, and that person, you probably know, it's the pastor. When someone is struggling or, or has a need in their lives, they're likely immediate thought is, man, I, 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 I got to sit down with a pastor. I need some help. Um, in the same fashion, if you hear about someone who is struggling and you talk to them, it might be your natural inclination to actually say, you know, you need to give the pastor a call and, and get some care there, get some help. And in so doing, honestly, my friends, one anothering one another has been set aside in a way that I really don't think is biblical. So to provide care uh, for the many, many people who make up IPC, we have done some significant work over these last months, probably eight to ten months, um, on our vision. Now, initiating anything vision-related during COVID has been difficult. Uh, we've struggled to do that if you would but in this area we have done a lot of good hard work to facilitate how we might walk alongside people to a place of healing restoration and renewed joy and i'd like to share that with you today you see we want people who are grieving to move through the process of grief to find joy again in life which is so possible we want people who who maybe are struggling with an, an illness to have people walk alongside them so that they find God willing, healing. We want people who, who maybe are struggling with a depression or some other emotional difficulty to have people in their lives who will enable them to find restoration in their hearts that they might know joy again. We want people who maybe are struggling uh, with a financial crisis to get, get the help that they need so that they can get back on a solid footing financially and be able to move, move forward. How about people with addictions? Can we walk alongside such people, all of us, in some way in order that they might break free from the power of that addiction and, and sin which has overtaken their lives? I, w I hope, you, my friends, you're, you're seeing the possibility. I hope you're seeing the vision of what can be as we one another, one another, as Andy Stanley puts it. And to enable this, essentially, what we have done is form what we are calling IPC Care, a new ministry in the life of our church. And we formed a team, which we call the IPC Care Team, in order that uh, we might have people to give leadership to this whole process and be actively involved in it. What I want to do is describe to you um, a diagram, and we'll do that in a minute. It's called the Ripple Diagram. Uh, it's based on the idea that if you throw a stone into a calm pond of water, uh, that stone falling in the water will, will create concentric circles moving out. Uh, from where the stone landed, of course. Uh, and this ripple diagram is basically intended to illustrate how we foresee caring going forward in an one anothering kind of way. So let's take a look at this. You're going to be looking at it for a little while. I'll talk you through it, and uh, I'll explain it to you. So the diagram itself looks like this. <clears throat> You'll see that in the middle of the diagram is a person. That's that's the person who's hurting. That's, if you would, where the stone has landed in the pond. That's where the need exists. And then you have concentric circles going out from that person. And these concentric circles are different levels of care, if you would. Now, the, the first uh, level of care, if, if you want to put it that way, uh, is uh, defined uh, in, in by three ways. But essentially, what we're wanting, first and foremost, in greatest measure, is that the first point of contact for care for anyone who is struggling and in need is their life group. Um, that they might share that need, that that need might become known, uh, that that need might be cared for. Now, we've included, as you'll see, ministry groups in this. Um, each one of these ministry groups, which I'll mention, uh, have expressions, or most of them do, of, of life group in them. But they are, as you can see, I believe in the bottom. Where is this now? It maybe isn't there. Sorry. Oh, um, yes. It's, it, let me just describe it to you. These ministry groups are Impact, our men's ministry, Sisterhood, our women's ministry, Oasis, that ministry for people who are, 
well, my age, and, and I suppose up, um, they, they, they have larger group meetings, but then they break down into small groups, life groups, essentially. And then it also includes ministry teams. Just by way of illustration, think of our worship team. Uh, people can care for one another in, in the worship team. So what ideally is to happen in this model is that as we move forward, um, people uh, who have a need, who are struggling in some way, uh, make an approach. It could be to the life group itself, to that small group of people that they have learned to trust and, 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 and uh, whom they know love them as an individual who is struggling and hurting. Um, if a person prefers, they can go to the life group leader and share the need, the reality in the life that is, is, is causing the struggle. Let me clarify, the ministry of caring is not that of the life group leader. It's that of the life group as a whole. So that when a life group discovers that somebody among them is struggling, that group can activate. That group can get busy and move into action <clears throat> to do what the Bible says, to love that person, to serve them, to encourage them, to pray for them, to be good to them. Whatever the one anothering method is, that can become the reality in that person's life. It allows people in those groups who have spiritual gifts to use them. It allows people in those groups who have special and distinct abilities, which God has given them, to use those gifts and those abilities to bless the life of this person so that this group rallies around that individual and helps them, and helps them move from brokenness and hurt and struggle and difficulty to a point of healing, restoration, and renewed joy. Um, now, you'll see uh, that also, and if you, would, if you w want to describe it, the top left of that inner circle, you'll see newcomers group. And this is a new way for us to integrate people into the life of our church. Previously, we've had greeting people on Sunday morning, newcomers lunch, IPC one-on-one -on -one with me, uh, and then hopefully move people, encourage people into a life group itself. Well, now this is going to replace that dynamic. And the idea is that we would create a small group of people who are new to the church, that that group would exist for six to eight weeks or so, and <clears throat> those people would build relationships with one another, of course, but also that, that we would share with them the vision and the values of IPC. They could meet elders and staff. They could hear descriptions about our various ministries and how we function and uh, really get to know the church and how to get involved. And at the end of that six or eight-week period, that group can do one of two things. They can choose to carry on as a, as a life group in our church, or they can uh, go their own way and join, ex and join existing groups. But even there, people are going to have the opportunity to one another, one another, and love one another as the opportunity presents itself. So that's the first level of care. The first point of contact we're saying essentially is in the life group, small group dynamic so that we as one another can care for the person who is struggling. Now in the next level of care, what you'll see is, if you would, uh, not bottom right, but to the right and down, <coughs> references individuals who aren't in a life group or in one of these ministries that I'm describing to you. And what we have prepared there is the IPC care team. Uh, there are individuals who have been trained and who are ready, five or six of them, I believe, uh, to visit and to care for people who are struggling, who don't have the close contacts, loving relationships with people in the church so that they can be cared for in that way. And th that's going to be available to folks. Uh, it, it doesn't matter who you are or how involved you are. We want to lovingly care for and support people in their struggle and in their challenge and in their difficulty. So what happens then? And we're going to move that now to the outer circle, and there are lots of different possibilities here. But what happens when someone uh, is in a life group, but the life group realizes that maybe the need of this individual, and it happens, is greater than what the life group can adequately care for, care for well. And that does happen when real crisis and struggle and har hardship happens. Well, this is the outer ring, then, of the circle that I'm going to speak to. And if you look right at the top, you'll see focus groups. Focus groups are groups where, uh, which we're going to form of people who have a similar need, struggle, difficulty. Look at the top right of the illustration in the box, and you'll see people who need divorce care. People who have divorced, there's a, a journey they have to walk. And if, if we have several people who are, have just gone through that, we can bring them together, give them trained leadership, teach them about this process, what they need to know, and just 
helps them through it. Now, they can one another one another, as the leader also does the same. Whether it be for grief care, my goodness, that's a hard journey to take from grief to joy. Um, but again, there are steps that people need to move through. And the more they're aware of those steps, the more they feel at peace because they are where they're supposed to be and they can be informed about how to make their way through each step. And grief groups could be formed and many other groups of I in similar fashion. So those will be formed as the need arises, as we see uh, a number of people in the same struggle and challenge. Move a little farther, you'll see elders. Now, essentially, the elders have agreed to activate that ministry that's described in James 5 about anointing with oil. The elders are to anoint with oil and, pray, oil and pray for healing. And the elders are ready to do that. Move a little farther ar around the circle, you'll see care and compassion fund. Now, that's a fund we've had for many years. And it's a fund to provide for the uh, needs of people in our church and sometimes in our community who, who really are struggling financially. Uh, we've put food on the table for people. We've... We've put fuel oil in, in their tanks so they can heat their homes in the winter. That kind of thing, just as the need exists. And it also is used to provide money for uh, counseling when that's necessary and uh, in, in some, some form or other. Uh, it is the IPC care team and I believe one other elder or individuals from the team who will administer that and deal confidentially with people who might make a request or who be we become aware of are in that situation. So that is a financial way of, of supporting the care. Move a little farther, bottom of the circle, you'll see professional support. And there are times when individuals need to have counseling, need someone who is specialized in giving care and really deeply understands some of the struggles people endure. And uh, we have prepared a list of Christian counselors in the area and we'll uh, encourage people to that when necessary. Remember, even there, one anothering has happened, Christian to Christian. Beyond that, you'll see Healing Care Ministry as we round the corner uh, on the left side. And this is a ministry that's been functioning in our church for uh, four years now. It's taken a pause because of COVID, but it will reactivate. And it's been a huge blessing in the lives of some of our people. What it really is there for is, is a ministry for people who are just struggling with life. Um, who just, if you would, can't make life work the way they want to. Make their relationships work they want, the way they want to. And the idea is that uh, as people engage the healing care process, they are gently led to an awareness of the wounds that underlie the struggles uh, that, that are in their hearts, that are in their souls. And through the process, uh, they encounter Christ and he brings healing to those areas of woundedness. It's a beautiful and a wonderful thing. And that will be there as well. Um, and uh, just before I speak to the reality of pastor, let me clarify this for everyone. If indeed in the small group dynamic uh, there's a recognition that people need more, then a, a, a referral, if you would, would be met by life group leader or people in the life group itself to suggest any of these outer ring possibilities. Uh, a bit of a transfer from one context into another uh, that help might be provided, which is necessary. Now, let me speak to the last item, the role of the pastor, because obviously that will remain important. And in our model, what we have uh, done is define the role of the pastor is as one of addressing emergencies or the various crises that come into people's lives. Um, well, most obvious one is when a death occurs. Uh, pastors get there pretty quickly and comfort and pray with and bring hope to people. And of course, there's a funeral to be planned and so forth. And of course, the pastor will continue in that role. That just makes sense. Sometimes there's a serious accident a crisis in that fashion can get to that place. Uh, maybe there's a marital breakup and um, uh, people, are, people are reeling. Well, that's a place where a pastor can step in and, and bring some help. And of course, with time, then, obviously, the, those folks uh, can be plugged into various ways of IPC care that one another and one another might take place. You know, I'm just going to mention the hospital visit. Again, Somebody goes in the hospital, everybody thinks, well, the pastor will visit. I would say in the most critical cases, yes, that's the role of the pastor. But can I suggest to you, if someone in your life group goes in the hospital, and we're post-COVID COVID with this comment. This is after all the restrictions have been lifted and people can go and visit individuals in the hospital. If you really love someone who's in the hospital, that's a scary thing. That's a difficult thing. Um, well, w would you consider one anothering one another by just 
having people from the life group go and visit that person and pray with them and read scripture for them. Boy, what a powerful impact that would make in the lives of many people. So the, even there, the pastor is involved in the crisis scenario. Life groups not can handle it otherwise. Listen, what I want you to notice lastly from our graphic is the IPC care team box, which uh, is sort of at the top, if you would, of the illustration. Note, please, that that box covers all three rings in the illustration, all three categories. And the IPC care team um, has, has uh, the responsibility, if you would, of giving oversight to this whole process. It will communicate the process well. It's going to take us time to really embrace a paradigm shift. Uh, but they'll be communicating. They, they will make the connections which are necessary. And of course, when called upon, they will be there and available to do hands-on care of people in our congregation. Listen, there is the model. I'm going to invite Kelly Esseltine to come and speak briefly to you. Kelly is the leader of our IPC care team. Kelly has done a ton of work to uh, bring this presentation to the point that it's at now and, and defining the model uh, as we have it along with others and um, just ask her to speak briefly to you. Then we'll come together, and uh, there'll be um, a time of prayer and commissioning. So let's listen to Kelly now. Thank you, Pastor Chris, and good morning, church. I'm going to briefly go over how to access care at IPC. Um, now that Chris has given you the the background information on the care team. Um, the first thing I'm going to look at is uh, who do I talk to when? Um, we have three, essentially three levels of care, um, life groups, which are the more mild um, issues. We have the care team who will take on the more moderate issues, and then Pastor Chris, who will deal with the severe issues. Um, He's gone over some of the circumstances, and if you'd like more information on that, um, you can tune in to the midweek on Wednesday, and um, I'll go over some more of that in detail. The thing that we really want to focus on this morning, though, is how to access care at IPC. There's three main ways to do that. Um, if you're in a life group, you'll contact your life group, and if the needs become more than the life group, um, can handle, they will put in a referral to the IPC care team, and then we will uh, take over, walk alongside your life group. The other way to access care is by calling the church. So if you're looking at our diagram, um, you'll see the church on the left. You can call or email, and that will that those messages will be passed on to the care team. Um, and then again, I will dispatch um, a member of the team to um, to reach out to the person that's needing care. The third way, the way in the middle, is through the prayer team. Um, you can send in a prayer request and um, ask for um, a member of the team um, to come out and visit. Um, to access care, uh, you're going to call during business hours the church um, or send an email, as I said, and the email address that you see um, comes directly to me. You can click on the prayer and care link um, on the website of I thrive at ipc.com. Um, there's an after business hours, which is my number. Again, it'll come directly to me. And if you're in need of the Care and Compassion Fund that Pastor Chris mentioned, you can contact Maureen Harbinson, Wendy Lance, or myself, and we will be in touch to see how we can help with the needs th that you have. So thank you, and we are going to um, go turn things back over to Pastor Chris to introduce the team and to commission the team. Well, we're gathering on a Zoom call uh, uh, at this point in order to commission this team. Uh, the people that you see before you are um, the IPC care team. They've been working really hard over the last uh, months in order to prepare the ministry that I've shared with you today. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're excited to commission them and to, to pray for them and ask God to really use these people as they, uh, as they serve and as they love and as they pray for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, God's people might know healing and, and blessing in their lives. So to begin with, I'll, I'll just introduce the team. Kelly Esseltine is the leader. 
Um, yeah, you can wave if you like. Uh, Maureen Harbinson. Um, I'll go around the circle. Charles Bowes, Paul Harbinson, and Phil Morden. And uh, yeah, thank you for being willing to do what you have done and, uh, you know, having a heart for the people of our church and really being eager to be used by God to bless them and to help them and, uh, and to lead them forward in their journeys. So um, as, as we come now, I'm, I'm literally just going to pray. I'm going to pray that God would bless this team. I'd invite uh, you as the congregation to, to pray along uh, with me and, uh, and uh, we together will bring these five before God and ask God to really work through them and uh, touch the lives of many people in a pretty deep way. So let's pray. And gracious God, we do come to you uh, recognizing your desire for our church. Uh, Lord, we've talked today about one anothering and how incredibly important it is that we care for one another together as, as your church family. Lord, we, we have prayed that you'll enable us to uh, do all of us what we're to do what we're called to do. But we come now specifically, Lord, to um, commission this team, this group of people who have given themselves to building this ministry, to, um, to serve people, and uh, Lord, to, to walk alongside those who are hurting, uh, those who need it in particular, those who, uh, who come their way for the care and the love uh, and the wisdom of God and the encouragement of God uh, to, to be in their lives. So I, I, I now pray for these five, Lord. I pray that your spirit would be upon them. I pray that uh, you would uh, guide them in, in very specific ways as they meet with people. Lord, I would pray that you would give them uh, real love in their hearts and compassion. Lord, I pray that you give them wisdom in their minds. Lord, I pray that you would give them the words to speak that would be seasoned with grace and, and filled with love and filled with hope. And Lord, we would just ask that um, as they do their work among us, that we would recognize how blessed we are. Lord, fan into flame, flames the gifts that you have given to each one of them uh, and use them. Use them as an instrument uh, uh, to, uh, to, to bless lives and to care for lives and simply be good to people. Father, I want to pray for Kelly as she gives leadership to the team. Uh, that's a, a special and added responsibility just in itself. But we do ask that you would enable her, that she would lead well, uh, that Lord, that uh, uh, as she gives leadership to this team and indeed then to the entire ministry, that uh, you would provide for her needs and that uh, you would uh, lead her forward as she follows you, Lord, in, in the development of this ministry. So, Lord, in prayer now, we, we do commission this team. Uh, we commit them to you, and we pray that uh, through their work, many people might know your love and your grace in their lives. Lord, ultimately, we do want people to find um, that, that uh, restoration and, and healing and um, a recovery of joy in life. Use these people, Lord, in a, in a unique and special way to accomplish that purpose. So, God, in in the name of Christ, we pray these things, knowing that, uh, that we can trust you uh, to respond to the prayers that we've offered up now. And these things we do ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you be gracious to you Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace oh.
face shine upon me and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you friends, as we wind up today, uh, be aware that we, today in hearing about the biblical model of one anothering one another, are actually being called to, to blessing, uh, to being blessed when we're struggling and hurting, and having a church which will rally around and really care for us, but at the same time being people who can bless others in that state. God wants us blessed, right? And to use his people in order to do it. So essentially, benediction is, is a blessing that I wish to give you now, and um, it's the blessing of God upon you. So to that end, I, I bless you in the name of God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that you might be blessed in him, that you might know his blessing in your life, and that you might be a blessing to others and find the blessing in yourself that can be had when you care for others in this way. Amen. Thank you.
find me here again in my stillness you read my heart every page every Yeah.
Church.